Hello, everybody. Look up temptation in the dictionary, and it will almost certainly say C, first generation Porsche Cayenne. And why wouldn't it? This is a car with a lot going for it. It has a highly desirable badge, a series of impressively girthy engines, a gorgeous leather covered and luxurious interior, and genuine off road capability. And all this for less than half the price of a brand new Fiat 500 electric. Why then is it that even the most foolish of foolhardy types or the most dedicated of bargain hunters would tell you to steer well clear of this? That's because ask just about anybody on the street and they will tell you herein lies automotive damnation and ruination. Well, I've had enough. Today, I'm going to bat for the first generation Porsche Cayenne because I think it's just about time that we change our opinion on this greatly misunderstood car. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I must also confess, for I have played my own small part in this heinous crime, the assassination of the reputation of the first generation Porsche Cayenne, known to some as the 9PA, others the 955 and subsequently 957, and to some the E1. This first generation car ran from 2003 until 2010, when it was replaced by the second generation that somehow dodged much of the criticism that still surrounds this. Only just a month ago, I was chatting with my friend Jack from the channel number 27. We were shooting video ideas back and forth, as we often do. And he said, I've got a piece coming up on three cars that are incredibly cheap to buy, but extraordinarily expensive to run. And I said, with cat-like reflexes, ah, early Porsche Cayenne. That is our byword for Bork. In fact, it's not often known, but Cayenne is an ancient German word meaning, bloody hell, how much? But you see, like so many people, I was making a grievous mistake because there was one small piece of the puzzle that was missing. I had never, ever experienced the car which I had damned so completely. I then remembered that late last year, a lovely chap called Mark had got in touch and said, James, I have an early Cayenne Turbo. It's my car for when I visit England. He lives abroad. Would you like to have a go in it? Because I think it's the best value car out there in terms of how much power you get for your money. So I had my light bulb moment and I said, Mark, I'd love to drive your car, but do you mind if I do a slightly more in-depth investigation? Rather than just taking it out for a few hours, can I live with it for a week, use it every single day and see how long it takes before it either empties my wallet or leaves me stranded? To his credit, he said, yes, of course, no problem, do your thing. So I picked it up and how far did we get before it let me down? Half an hour. Oh yes, don't worry, this is not going to be an entirely one-sided piece. I am more than aware of the KN's faults. I just happen to believe that far, far too much focus has been given to those rather than its many strengths. <laughs> The cause of that incident was a fairly simple one, and certainly not Cayenne specific. Because Mark lives abroad, this car has been in storage for quite some time. And during that period, it hasn't been on a trickle charger. So before I collected it, it was jump started, and the half an hour drive that I gave it was nowhere near enough to charge the battery. It turns out, said battery was actually totally dead. Even with a little bit of assistance, we could not get the car going. It has now been fitted with a fresh battery and subsequently has never failed to proceed. Even so, there are still quite a few issues with this car. Mark has offered to get them all sorted and return the car to me for up to a month, which I will be taking them up on. But I decided that even in its current state, there was actually something to be said for this car. And in many ways, perhaps this is the ideal state to be talking about this exact thing. What then exactly is wrong with it? Well, take your pick of the clonks and knocks coming from the front and the rear, the brake booster warning, which is rather alarming, but to be honest, doesn't seem to be affecting things. The car still stops. The handbrake light, which is a touch too sensitive. You need to hoist the thing up with your foot to get that to turn off. The gearbox, which evidently needs a service because on occasion, particularly when cold, it will lurch rather nastily. 
the tow bar at the back, which has been fitted in such a way that if you try and get it to stow away, it will crush its own cables. The infotainment system, of which amplifier, CD changer, nav and phone are not working. That's almost certainly due to the battery being dead. The fact that after we've had a little bit of rainfall, the car does seem to leak. Not through the sunroof, but impressively, the sunroof controls. And also this little bit of trim here. I'm rather worried there's a paddling pool above me. The parking sensors are also part-time, and when they do choose to spring into action at random moments at junctions and the like, they are wholly inaccurate. And the car also seems to be drinking coolant. Other than that, though, it's brilliant. The air suspension surprisingly works, as does the engine. The reason Mark billed this car as the ultimate bargain, the most horsies for the money in his words, is because it's an example of an early KN Turbo. There was a Turbo S, but they share effectively the same engine, a 4.5 litre twin turbocharged V8. In standard guise, that would have made 450 horsepower, but this one's been remapped, so now it makes, allegedly, 570. And I can believe it, the car may weigh two and a half tons, but put your foot down and this thing shifts. I've no doubt a whole bunch of you are currently sat there going, well, that's not really particularly impressive, is it, James? A big, fast 4x4 that is constantly broken and will cost you a fortune, regardless of whether it's working or not. Range Rover have been doing that for 50 years. Ah, but you see, the Cayenne is so much more than that. This really is a genuinely brilliant car, one that I would put in the category of annoyingly good. It's a car I don't want to like because there's so much to loathe about it. For myself and many others, I'm sure, my disdain of the KN began when it was launched 20 years ago, way back in 2003. As far as I was concerned, Porsche were a purveyor of sports cars. They didn't really need to make anything else. I was, of course, totally ignorant of the fact that the KN was about to make them a huge amount of money. As far as I was concerned, if you wanted a big posh 4x4, you went and bought a Range Rover, because that's what everybody did. You didn't want Range Rover to make a sports car, and you didn't want Porsche to make an SUV. Not that we called them SUVs then. This was actually a car of many firsts for the brand, a lot of which now are easy to forget. It was the first Porsche product to launch as an S variant before the regular one. It was only a year later we got the V6 engine regular KN, featuring the same engine as the Golf R32, a power plant that really was very, very under spec for a two and a half ton SUV. Why does it weigh so much? Well, because Porsche wanted this to be a genuinely capable off-roader, and you have to feel sorry for them. This is some 250 kilos heavier than the car that replaced it, because this one has a proper low-range gearbox in it, something I'm pretty certain just about no KN buyer actually ever put into use. And so for that reason, Porsche said afterwards, I don't think we'll bother doing that again. This was also a return to the format of front-engined V8, something Porsche hadn't done since the discontinuation of the 928 back in 1995. Later in its life with the facelift, the Cayenne also became the first Porsche of the modern era to wear the GTS badge, the last also being the old 928. As it happens, that GTS could be something of a sweet spot in the KN range, a 400-ish horsepower version of the naturally aspirated later 4.8 V8, combined with a slightly more sporting chassis, an interior with a bit of extra Alcantara to make it feel a touch sportier, and handling supposed to be a touch sharper than this. As a road car, it could be the best of them all. If you happen to have one and you're willing to let me have a go in it, please do get in touch. My email address is in the description of every single video. Likewise, if you have a later KN or um, just about anything interesting, please drop me a line. I do think Porsche made something of a fundamental error with the styling, particularly these early pre-facelift cars that run up to about 2007. They're just not lookers, are they? Porsche tried to make the front end look a little bit like a 911 Turbo, but the fact is, that only looks good on a 911 Turbo. This really was a very soft, wallowy, wibbly design that, even when new, didn't feel bang up to date. Range Rover, on the other hand, have managed to nail almost timeless styling, but this has dated fairly badly. The facelift, I think, with revised lights, front and rear, and slightly different bumpers, has done a lot better. But these early cars do look their age.
these also came from that wondrous era where big, luxurious, overly thirsty 4x4s were not the order of the day, so they depreciated pretty quickly. And, there's no delicate way to put this, but they weren't exactly bought by petrol heads. Those were the people that stuck with a 911, and if they wanted it, a Range Rover. But this was the kind of car bought by somebody that wanted all of the allure of a 911, but without having to deal with the hassle of, you know, getting in a car and enjoying driving it. This was the go-to school panzer of choice for anybody whose children were named Tarquin or Nigel. So, these were cars that even when new went far too long between services. I've seen plenty of examples that even when they were just five years old had only been seen by the garage twice because they hadn't done the miles. So why did they need a service? Many of them also lived in urban areas where people simply don't care about anyone else's things. So they got dinged, dented, scratched and all around mistreated pretty much the moment they were on sale. And it's no surprise to hear that anything that weighs two and a half tons that makes over 400 horsepower will chew through certain components fairly quickly. That's not really any fault of the car. That's simply physics. Bushes, bearings, brake discs, all that sort of stuff, these are all things that will wear. And if I'm being brutally honest, it is the people that bought these who I think are the worst part about the KN. The car really should be given massive credit for being the first to succeed in taking the fight to Range Rover. This was the first car that en masse stole customers away looking for a posh off-roader. However, it would appear that the customers Porsche nicked and continue to nick are some of the worst people in the entire world. I cannot ever remember being let out by a KN, but I can remember being cut up by one on more than a few occasions. Even while I've been driving this one around, I've waved at all my fellow KN drivers and not even a glance back. Actually, Porsche drivers on the whole seem to be really, really miserable folk. I don't know why, they should be really happy but they're not. And maybe those are the kind of people that let us get to the situation that we are now, where we have these cars that once upon a time cost the equivalent of over £100,000, now commanding barely a tenth of that. You can pick yourself up a regular KN for about three or four thousand pounds. Even a turbo, if you're very brave, for seven to eight, with a really good one being about 13. That's a ludicrous amount of car for the money. I have heard stories of cars in the trade, including turbos, changing hands for just two or three thousand pounds. These are cars with no margin in them whatsoever. The dealers selling them can't afford to get them back to good condition. These are now cars in that most precarious of places because they all need an amount spent on them that's going to be close, if not more than, the purchase price. And the fact is, people buying cars at this end of the market just won't have that amount of money to spend on them. But I am here to tell you that I think doing so is absolutely worth it because though everyone's happy to tell you all the stuff I've just gone through, the many, many ways in which a KN will bankrupt you, and I haven't even discussed a lot of them, like the air suspension or the engine coolant leaks, this is a brilliant car. That is the bit that they all leave out, don't they? How is it brilliant? Well, it's perfectly sized. Yes, it's a big 4x4, but compared to a lot of other stuff on the road today, it isn't actually that massive. To drive, it feels less daunting than a Jaguar F-Pace. I've got a good view of that bonnet. In here, you've got comfortable seating for four good-sized adults. I've got this seat in my preferred driving position, and there's loads of legroom behind me. The boot is also a very generous size. It has a split tailgate that doesn't fold out like the Range Rover does. It does still have two sun visors like a Range Rover, though. See? That's nice. In terms of length, it's actually surprisingly short. The car is about 4.8 metres, meaning it's not as long as a Jaguar XJ, my old Maserati Quattroporte, my S-Class, my 7 Series, or a whole bunch of other cars that in your head are much smaller than this. This, I think, to many people is a really big car, but the fact is, it isn't. It's not a small one. New drivers certainly would be daunted by it, but as an experienced driver, it's very easy to place. It also manages to achieve something I did not expect. This car replicates the warmth that you get from a Jaguar or a Land Rover. After a nice long day where I've been outside filming and it's cold and miserable, 
This is a lovely thing to just sit down into, or climb up into. These seats are fantastic, really soft, supple. They are comfy old chairs. I love them. Loads of adjustment too. Same goes for the steering wheel. Both are heated, by the way. Once it's warmed up and it's behaving, the gearbox works fairly well, and that engine is mighty. Almost impossible to catch off guard. From about 2,000 RPM, it has ludicrous reserves of torque. Get it to about three, Oh my word! Even the steering's pretty decent. OK, as it's a proper 4x4, it's not the fastest rack, but you don't want that. However, it does have a good amount of heft. It even gives you a little bit of texture and feedback, which you would not expect. This really is a joy to drive. This interior, too, does not get the credit it deserves. OK, it's now a touch out of date, but for its time, it was actually fairly forward-thinking. It essentially previewed the interior that we later got in the 987 Boxster, Cayman and the 997 Generation 911. This is massively important because if you remember the 996 and 986, though I love those cars, perhaps more than many, one thing I cannot defend is the interiors. They're cheap and nasty, no matter which one you get in. But here, this feels like a proper car. This feels like Porsche realised they had to go back up market, and they succeeded. Even the wood, daft though it may be in a car like this, doesn't actually feel wholly out of place. Sure, fuel economy is not so good. I have two figures to offer you. The computer down here seems to think I've done 25.5 to the gallon which would be pretty good if true, but up here it's claiming 16.2, and that feels a little closer to the truth. The tank here is 100 litres, by the way, so even if it does drink like Oliver Reed, at least it'll keep going for quite a while. As I've said, I'll be revisiting this car in a slightly more factual way in the near future, and if you've had the pleasure or displeasure of owning an early first-generation Cayenne, I'd love to hear your feedback on it. Was it actually surprisingly fine, or did it ruin you and do all the things your mother warned you about? But I think it should say everything you need to know about the first-gen Cayenne, that despite having had little to no interest in one for the 20 years the car has been on sale, after just a few days living with one, I'm now considering buying one. And I know, that's a really, really disgusting thought. I would become the very thing I sought to destroy. I would become a Porsche But it's a really good car. A really, really good car. Mm. Well, anyway, I hope that's provided you with a little bit of food for thought. I want to say a huge thanks to all of you for watching. Don't forget, hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.